I now want to look at the history of the introduction of MMR vaccine. And what's interesting about that, certainly in the United States of America, is that it's the mumps vaccine that was the key to this. It was an exclusive vaccine owned by Merck and enabled Merck to formulate an MMR that was subsequently adopted in the UK. The question is, was mumps vaccine needed? Was MMR vaccine adequately tested? Did it comply with the standards set out by the World Health Organization, as we've seen earlier? What were the quality of the clinical trials? What was the post-licensing surveillance for adverse reactions to this vaccine? What were the findings and what were the problems that we've seen with MMR? So the first mumps vaccine came in the United States of America, licensed in 1967, the Gerald Lynn strain, which was isolated from the daughter of the head of vaccine research at Merck, Morris Hillerman. It was licensed in 1971 across the country uh, and became the recommended vaccine by the CDC. That's the point at which it became widely used from 1982 onwards and is currently used today. This is a story of failed efficacy as we have described in a previous lecture. The vaccine did not work adequately. It was a different story in the UK and elsewhere. The UK predominantly used a strain of mumps called Urabi AM9, and this came from the Japanese. It was isolated in 1967, but not licensed in Japan until much later, 79. In 1988, it was incorporated into MMR and licensed as Pluserix in the UK. The French, uh, under Aventis Pastemeria, had a similar vaccine that they called Imravax that took a small proportion of the UK market. In 1988, due to safety concerns, Pluserix, also called Trivirix in Canada, but exactly the same vaccine, was withdrawn in that country for causing meningitis. In 1991, there was a worldwide withdrawal of Pluserix by the manufacturers, Smith, Klein, Beecham, except in the United Kingdom. And it was not until 1992 that it was finally withdrawn in the UK, and this was a failed safety issue. So first question, was mumps vaccine needed? Here is the official viewpoint from the British Medical Association and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in the UK. Since mumps and its complications are very rarely serious, there is very little indication for the routine use of mumps vaccine. And in the United States, Donald Henderson, who was a senior official at the Centers for Disease Control when asked was mumps vaccine needed, answered no. Now, our understanding of what happened in the UK is a very, very interesting story came from Dr. Alistair Torres, a government whistleblower with whom I met many years ago and told us the story of the licensing process for that vaccine in the UK. The DOH, the Department of Health, was reluctant to use MMR2, Merck's vaccine, because of its high price and therefore asked for a competing vaccine manufacturer, SmithKline French, for a cheaper MMR vaccine. However, SKF's MMR vaccine contained the Urabi mump strain. The Department of Health knew that the Urabi mumps vaccine was causing safety concerns in Canada because of high rates of meningitis it was causing. SmithKline French were concerned about these safety issues and were understandably reluctant to obtain a UK license for their Urabi containing MMR vaccine Pluserix. But the government was intent on obtaining a cheap MMR. SmithKline French asked the UK government to offer them indemnity against possible legal action taken against them as a result of the introduction of Pluserix. Dr Torres went on, the UK government in its enthusiasm to get a cheap MMR onto the market agreed to this request. This is denied to this day, by the way. This is both surprising and disturbing as the Department of Health and hence the UK government were well aware of the problems occurring with the Urabi strain of mumps vaccine, not only before the vaccine was given to millions of children in this country, but even before the Department of Health approved the vaccine for use by giving it a license. So how did this attitude of the UK government, its enthusiasm for getting this cheap vaccine into the UK market. How did it influence the safety and efficacy testing? Let's go back to the World Health Organization's requirements 
for vaccine safety testing. National regulatory authorities, NRAs, are responsible to ensure the quality, safety and effectiveness of vaccines and other pharmaceutical products. Before their introduction into an immunization program, vaccines undergo several steps of evaluation to assess their safety and efficacy in clinical trials. In pre-licensure safety studies, vaccines like other pharmaceutical products undergo extensive safety testing in three phases of clinical trials in human subjects before licensure. Is that what happened? The standard for vaccines and pharmaceuticals, long-term double-blind pre-licensure clinical trials during which the rate of adverse reactions are monitored and compared to the rate of adverse reactions in a group receiving an inert placebo such as saline injection would be the appropriate placebo in a measles vaccine trial. In the UK, what actually happened? Again, from Dr. Alistair Torres. In clinical trials of a vaccine, phase one trials are involving tests on animals. Phase two involve human trials. With MMR, these trials were circumvented to allow the vaccine to be widely used. In other words, they weren't done. Despite the World Health Organization's reassurances that this is the standard before vaccines are put onto the market, in the UK, in their enthusiasm to get a cheap vaccine made by the home team, Smith, Klein, Beecham, onto the market, then these studies were not done. Instead of randomised placebo-controlled trials, the UK's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JCVI, relied upon data from other countries. And in the minutes of the JC, JCVI from 1986, redacted name, inquired about the risk of adverse reactions. Further redacted names stated that favourable results on safety had been reported from both Finland and the USA. But the MMR vaccine being used in Finland and the USA was quite different. It was the Merck product. It was not the product containing the dangerous Urabi mumps vaccine and therefore was completely incomparable with the vaccine being used there. Further minutes, the manufacturer had unspecified data from elsewhere that they considered respectable. Really? The manufacturer considered data respectable? And on that basis, because they felt that respectable data from other countries would be acceptable to the Committee on Safety of Medicines, it might be possible in this way to move directly towards a license application without clinical trials. This is extraordinary. In 1987, the UK trial was conducted. It involved 5,000 children vaccinated with the Urabi containing MMR vaccine in three United Kingdom health districts. There were mixed formulations of the MMR. There was a 21-day parent diary card to record adverse events. And in 1995, in a summary of the product characteristics for Pluserix, GlaxoSmithKline report it is very rare for aseptic meningitis to appear prior to 30 days post-vaccination with this product. In other words, a 21-day diary card kept by the parents is going to miss all but a vast minority of the cases of meningitis, the specific concern that you're worried about. In the study, there were no placebo controls, no randomization, in other words, no science. Post-marketing surveillance. What was done after the vaccine was put onto the market and given to millions of children? Dr. Peter Fletcher, who was a senior advisor at the Medicines Control Agency, with whom I met many years ago, said Dr. Susan Wood from the MCA, the Medicines Control Agency, had urged SmithKline French to conduct post-marketing surveillance on Pluserix because of their concerns about meningitis with the Urabi strain mumps vaccine, they urged the drug company to conduct active marketing to determine whether or not this was occurring in UK children. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Because they had liability indemnity. From the JCBI minutes of the 7th of May 1993, SKB, Smith, Klein, Beecham, continued to sell the Urabi strain vaccine without liability without anyone knowing 
the government appear to have granted them an indemnity and they weren't going to conduct post-marketing surveillance. Why would you want to find an adverse event when there are no consequences for you in selling this vaccine? And there were further warnings. In the minutes of the meeting of 1988, the committee felt that the rate of adverse reactions, that meningitis to the mumps components of MMR from Canada, was in keeping with that expected from a live virus vaccine. In other words, there were warnings. They were getting warnings from other countries saying, this Urabi-containing MMR vaccine is dangerous, and they dismissed them. They were in keeping with what was expected. October 1998, MMR vaccination campaign was launched in the UK. Three brands were licensed, and immediately there were reports of meningitis. In a further warning, May the 4th, 1990, of a special concern to the committee were reports from Japan of a high level of meningoencephalitis, inflammation of the lining of the brain and the brain itself associated with the administration of the MMR. However, the committee concluded that the Japanese experience may be due to different reporting or investigating criteria or other local factors. What, like sushi? I mean, what possible reason could they have for coming to this conclusion without due investigation. It's an extraordinary failure of pharmacovigilance. And inevitably, in 1991, just as we'd seen in Canada and elsewhere in the world, there was a worldwide withdrawal of Pluserix by SmithKline Beecham. Interestingly, no product recall. That would have been an admission of a problem. But to simply withdraw the vaccine and not provide it, that provided an easier solution. In September 1992, there was suspension of the vaccine in the UK and a, an urgent replacement with the MMR2 from Merck. In the final analysis, meningoencephalitis was reported with this Urabi MMR vaccine by 28 days post-vaccination at eight times the rate expected in the same period from natural mumps. Bear in mind, this is a vaccine that the authorities considered was never needed in either America or the UK. In the Japanese study that later followed 38,000 children receiving one of four licensed MMR vaccines for 35 days in Japan identified a rate of mumps vaccine meningitis of one in 600. This was not an uncommon reaction. It was unexpected observation and it went virtually unnoticed. What is even more interesting to me is that in Japan and elsewhere, the Urabi AM9 mumps vaccine was used for many years as a single mumps vaccine. Five million doses were given. And as a single vaccine, there were virtually no cases of meningitis reported. With MMR, it was one in 600. It became obvious. It led to the withdrawal of the vaccine. If using the single vaccine there was an association with meningitis. There should have been in the order of 8,000 cases of vaccine-associated meningitis in Japan and elsewhere with the single vaccine. There weren't. It only became dangerous when it was combined with measles and rubella. Once again, one plus one plus one measles plus mumps plus rubella doesn't equal three. It equals something completely unknown. The Japanese remarked the mechanisms behind the higher incidence of aseptic meningitis with the combined live MMR vaccine and that with the monovalent mumps vaccine were not clearly identified. They weren't clearly identified. They weren't identified at all. They weren't researched at all. Here we had a fascinating and important observation that combining these vaccines was completely altering the outcome from the component viruses and nothing further was done. In summary, the pre-licensing studies in the UK bore no resemblance whatsoever to the World Health Organization's description of what should and they believed did happen. That licensing was liability free with no one knowing about it. That after licensing, active surveillance from the drug company itself was urged. Passive surveillance failed to identify a relatively common adverse event. And the World Health Organization's notion that authorities continue to monitor and investigate adverse events following immunization to ensure that they are safe for the entire population is clearly 
false. And what we're witnessing here is a complete failure of the regulatory process with harm to children. There's a postscript to this story. You would think that having withdrawn this vaccine worldwide in developed countries, that it would be taken off the shelf and thrown away. No, it wasn't. The UK's stocks of unused MMR vaccine were sold by Smith Klein Beecham on to Brazil in 1997, where they conducted a mass vaccination campaign. All children in the country intended to be vaccinated within one month. There were no special arrangements to implement post-marketing surveillance to determine whether these children were going to suffer from meningitis, but predictably there was an epidemic of meningoencephalitis. And here you see this represented graphically, the white bars, the number of cases of meningoencephalitis prior to the vaccine campaign, and then this dramatic increase in the face of the vaccine campaign. And perhaps the most cynical and most alarming comment came in a paper that described the aftermath of this campaign. This study raises new practical issues regarding public health. The issue is not simply whether or not a specific vaccine is associated with an adverse event, but the extent to which a specific vaccination strategy influences the visibility of the adverse event despite its confirmed relative rarity. Now, I may be of limited cognitive complexity, but reading this, I take from it that we should not be doing mass vaccination campaigns because they reveal the true rate of adverse events to a vaccine. I believe that that is what this is saying. If there is something ambiguous about that, Dr. Poland, or something other that you take from it, please let me know.